Welcome. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith United Methodist Church. Today, we start our summer sermon series through the Gospel of Luke. This will be an exciting eight-week journey where we will read, study, pray together through one of the four Gospels. You'll hear familiar stories, you'll be challenged in unexpected ways, and if you stay with us through this series, I know you'll be blessed. If you have children with you this morning, please know that we'll have a time for kids in the service immediately following our opening hymn. We hope you'll also check out this week's online Sunday School lesson with Miss Kim. You can find the lesson on our church website and kids' Facebook page. You can see the information here. If this is your first time worshiping with us, thank you. Please check out our website and learn more about our church's ministries. If Faith is your church family, thank you too for joining us again. Please contact the church office if we can pray for you or support you during these challenging times. Now, let's sing together our opening hymn. everybody. I'm here again for Faith Kids on this Sunday morning. I just want to talk to you a little bit about just how seriously I take my job here at Faith. Each week, I try to give you a message of encouragement and love during Faith Kids, and I research these ideas, and I figure out what would be a great message to share this week. And so during my research this week, I found out that Dance Like a Chicken Day was actually on Thursday. Wah, wah. We missed it. And today's Sunday, so do we have to wait a whole other year to celebrate Dance Like a Chicken Day? Actually, no. And that's because my job as Director of Children's Ministry holds all kinds of powers of authority. And I have the authority to say that today we're going to celebrate Dance Like a Chicken Day. Hit it, girls! Super fun. I encourage all of you to dance like a chicken sometime today. I hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday. Goodbye, boys and girls. A note as we enter into this time of prayer. Prayers of the people is a call and response. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, you're invited to respond. Hear our prayer. This morning, we'll conclude our prayer time by singing the Lord's Prayer. One more note. After our prayer time, we're going to share one of the joys from this past week, which is the reception of six new members into our church family. They were received in a Zoom meeting last Saturday, May the 9th. In the video, uh, you're going to see some of our new members' faces along with our mentors and new member coordinators. But half of our new members, they joined Zoom using only audio, so you'll only hear 
their voices. But don't worry, you'll get to see all of their faces at the conclusion of the video. Now let us pray. Lord, in a world that is full of challenges, we turn to you. We confess that we are easily distracted. We know that we too often stray from your will, your voice, your way. Thank you that you are ever faithful. You never give up on us. You continue to reach out to us, to love and care for us, to call us back to yourself. So hear the prayers of our hearts this day. Lord, we pray for the world which continues to reel from the challenges from uh, the coronavirus pandemic. We pray for our nation's leaders, the leaders of Illinois, the leaders of our local communities, as they determine when and how to open up our communities and restart our economies. Give them wisdom and strength in these difficult times. Lord, we give thanks for the courage and devotion of medical personnel, doctors and nurses, paramedics and police, firefighters and first responders, and all those who are on the front lines. We pray for the workers in all essential businesses, in banks, grocery stores, gas stations, utilities. Guide them and protect them. Guard their health and the health of their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up our schools. We pray for our teachers, our amazing teachers who are doing their best to adapt and teach in this new e-learning environment. We pray for parents and students who are missing friends after school activities and sports. We pray especially for all graduates who are missing dances, award ceremonies, graduations. Comfort them in their sadness. Bless them in these last days of school. Remind them that you have a good future with hope for each and every one of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling this day with sickness and sadness and pain. We lift up all who are fighting corona, uh, coronavirus. We lift up all who are facing ongoing treatments for other illnesses. We pray especially for Rich Cariel, Nikki Sturski, Mario Vergara, Bill Zeitz, and so many others. Lord, we lift up all who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would offer your comfort and your peace. Give your healing and hope and strength. Hear the prayers that we lift aloud as well as those that we lift up in the silence of our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us sing together the prayer that your son taught us to sing.
thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, we are going to receive uh, new members into the life of our church. Uh, these are folks who've gone through um, uh, classes, extended class, uh, back in March, and we weren't able to receive them uh, because of the, uh, the shutdown order, but we're going to receive them today. Uh, so we'll begin with our new member coordinators, um, Gwen and Nancy. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning's candidates for membership into Faith United Methodist Church. James Verbiao. John Kleinow, Rita Shinsky, Hannah Zarbuck, Austin Zarbuck, and Bob Stell. Friends, it is a joy and privilege to receive members into the life of the church. New members express their desire to join our faith family. They go through our new member class. They hear the history of Christianity, the United Methodist Church, and Faith United Methodist Church. They also learn about their unique spiritual gifts and how we are called to a life of service. We receive new members today, understanding that it is only the beginning of our life together. As they take vows into our church family, I ask us all to affirm our responsibility, to embrace them with the spirit of love, and help nurture them in faith recognizing that it is the Lord who calls us together to serve, to love, and to engage in Christ's mission. Okay, so now we're gonna go into uh, our vows. On behalf of the church, I ask you these questions, affirming your connection to Jesus Christ, his church, and this local congregation. And we see Grant, good morning, Grant. Okay, for everyone. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I, I do. do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I, I do. do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, say, I do. I do. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, answer, I will. I will. I will. As members of this local congregation, Faith United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries and by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, embrace the life and mission for which we are called? If so, answer, I will with God's grace. I will. I will. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the household of God, we commend these people to your life and care. May we do all we can to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and welcome them with Christ's love. Hey, uh, mentors, everyone who's watching, let's offer a round of applause for the newest members of our church family.
Good morning. Today's scripture comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first generation and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time for her to deliver her child came, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning or afternoon, or whenever you are watching this. It's one of the oddities of online worship is we worship at all sorts of different times now. Um, my name is Caitlin Nesbitt. I am the Associate Pastor at Faith. Thank you for joining us for this worship service. Today we are beginning our new sermon series, The Gospel of Luke. Last year, we spent the summer focusing on the Gospel of Mark. We went one chapter at a time. The Gospel of Luke is a little bit longer, so we're going to be spending each week of the series focusing on three chapters as we move through Luke. So you're invited to join us as we read through this series together each week. Um, three chapters a week. It might feel like a lot. It's really not too bad, I promise. It's some good old-fashioned quarantine fun since we're stuck in our houses anyway. Um, and really, the Gospel of Luke, it is one of my favorites. So I'm really excited for us to explore this together throughout the series. So um, let's say a prayer and get started on the Gospel of Luke chapters 1 through 3. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word that rests on our hearts, for your word that comforts us when we are in need, stirs us to get moving. We ask that wherever it is you are nudging us to go, we are open to you that your word rests on our hearts. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So um, just a bit of instruction for how this message is going to look. We are going to walk through um, an overview of the three chapters we're covering for the week. We'll be doing this throughout the series. And then we'll spend a little bit of time diving into our scripture passage for the week. So this sermon, it's a little different than our typical sermons because we are covering so much material, but it's also interesting and it's all really good. So we want to make sure that we aren't missing out on anything. So it's a little bit more of a teaching exploration type of a sermon, but there also is a good message because it's the Gospel of Luke and there's great stuff in here. Okay, so Luke chapters 1 through 3. Um, the first couple chapters of Luke, they're pretty familiar to most of us. They include Jesus's birth story, which is something that we cover each year during Advent and Christmas. And an interesting tidbit, well, I mean, it's interesting to me because I find all of this stuff fascinating, is that the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke are the only Gospels, really the only sources that we have that tell us the story of Jesus' birth. So what we have in the first couple chapters of Luke, it's actually really special because it allows us this insight into the very beginning of Jesus' life that we don't find in a lot of places, really just two places. Okay, so these three chapters... They can be broken into eight overarching categories. I know it sounds like a lot. We can even break it into many, many more. But they're really about eight overarching categories. First is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is the prologue. It's uh, The scriptural passage is our introduction, explaining the purpose that is this gospel of what it's written for. Spoiler alert, it is a compilation of the events of Jesus' life. That's what this is telling us. So overarching category two is Luke chapter one, verses five through 38. This is the enunciation of the birth of John the Baptist, as well as the enunciation of the birth of Jesus. So in the gospel of Luke, we find an emphasis of John the Baptist's parents and birth. This is something that is really unique to Luke. The Gospel of Matthew doesn't include how Zechariah and Elizabeth are unable to have kids, but miraculously conceive later. This is all Luke. It also includes how Zechariah went mute because he questions God's angel that Elizabeth would become pregnant. And while Elizabeth praised the Lord for what was done. So this is something we find uniquely in Luke. 
For some reason, I really find Zachariah becoming a mute interesting. I don't know what it is. I just, I always find that an interesting little fact. And so I always feel the need to mention it whenever I cover um, the beginning of Luke. Uh, here we also learn that the Gabriel not only visited Elizabeth, but also visited Mary and informed Mary that the Holy Spirit would come over her and she would conceive of a child, even though she was a virgin. And so this is where we learn Jesus's relationship to John. And since uh, Mary and Elizabeth are related, that's all covered in this overarching category here. Um, category three is Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. And this is when Mary visits Elizabeth. After her visit from Gabriel, Mary hurries and visits Elizabeth. And when hearing Mary's greeting, John leaps in Elizabeth's tummy. And so we are given this clue of how important Jesus is, that even John, who hasn't been born yet, can recognize Jesus, who hasn't been born yet. So there's really something special happening here. We also hear Elizabeth praising Mary and the promises that the Lord made to her. And we hear Mary's song of praise, also known as the Magnificant. And so in this song of praise, Mary praises God for all that God has done and gives us an idea of what Jesus will do with his life. And so this scriptural passage emphasizes many of the themes that we will find running throughout Luke, including God's concern for the lowly, the hungry, and the disadvantaged, as well as God's judgment of those who are self-indulgent or self-righteous. And so we get this idea that Luke is all about social social justice, Jesus and John are really going to be bringing that for us. That is what we find in our third category. Category four is Luke chapter one, verses 57 through 80. This is the birth of John the Baptist. So after Mary stays with Elizabeth and then returns home, John is born. And while those who came to circumcise John wanted to name him Zachariah, as it would be um, for their tradition, Elizabeth was told that his name was John, was told to name him John. And so there's a little bit of an argument there between those who came to circumcise him and Elizabeth. And Zachariah, who was mute, writes out his agreement with Elizabeth to name the baby John. So suddenly, Zachariah is no longer mute. Woohoo! He gets his voice back. Um, and once Zachariah can speak, he begins to praise God and reveals a prophecy about Jesus coming and how significant John and Jesus are going to be. And so again, this prophecy it is filled with themes of social justice. It predicts that the one who is coming will bring salvation to God's people and will guide them down this path of peace. Category five, Luke chapter two, verses one through 40. The birth of Jesus and the presentation of Jesus in the temple. We're combining those into one. So we'll be exploring Jesus's birth a little bit later in this message, but this section is where Jesus is born. And it's also the birth story where we hear shepherds herding their sheep, coming to visit him. And then after being born, Jesus was circumcised and named as the angel was instructed, as named Jesus. Um, and when he was taken to the temple as a baby, he was praised. And once again, we hear of the salvation that he will bring to his people, including the Gentiles. And so this is a really, uh, a really big point, because here we have Jesus' humble beginnings, as well as him being taken to the temple and acknowledgement within the already standing Jewish structure that Jesus is something special. Jesus is coming to bring salvation, um, not only for that community, but also for the Gentiles, which is a really important point in Luke because this gospel, it's written for a community that includes not only those who are Jewish, but also those who are Gentile. So there's this validation that Jesus's life and ministry, it was meant for something that included the people of Israel, but also extended beyond that group, which is it's different for a messianic view of the time period. And so that's um, a really important point. Section six, uh, Luke chapter two, verses 42 through 52. The boy Jesus in the temple. I always love this because it shows um, Jesus was a typical teenager, right? Doing what he wanted. Um, Jesus, when he was 12, his family visited Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And then after the festival, when they were on their way home, Jesus' parents realized that they lost him. And when they went back to find him, it turns out that he had stayed at the temple. They were really upset. And so they were asking him, why did you do this? Where were you? And he says, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? 
This reveals that Jesus was wise beyond his years. He was getting to something there. And it also reveals that Jesus is a typical 12-year-old, which I love of that part of this story. Knows what's best for him, right? Doesn't listen to his parents. Um, not that I condone that if you're 12 and listening to this. Listen to your parents. And don't just end up in a random temple. It is not safe. Okay, anyway, back on track. Category 7, Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. This is the setting of John's ministry, John's preaching, and the imprisonment of John. So this is really John the Baptist is this section. So jumping ahead a few years, we now find John the Baptist baptizing people in the Jordan River, calling on people to prepare for Jesus. That's how he's spending his ministry. He also follows that social justice theme in Luke. And so when we hear of his preaching, um, we hear him encouraging people to share what they can and no longer, and don't take more than you need. So it's really this idea of taking care of one another, sacrificing for one another, and giving to one another. And when Herod heard what was happening, he imprisoned John. So we also have this imprisonment of John. Category 8, our final category for chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 38. We have the baptism of Jesus and the genealogy of Jesus. So if you ever wonder why we use doves to depict the Holy Spirit, this scriptural passage, it is for you. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens, they opened and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and rested on him. And then we also hear this voice that spoke claiming Jesus. This is also where we learn that Jesus started his ministry at 30 years old. And then we get into the genealogy of Jesus, which if you want to explore that, I'm going to leave that for you for later. You can explore this genealogy. It goes all the way back to Adam. So that's pretty cool. But you can dive into that there. All right. Whew, I feel like we just ran a marathon through these three chapters. Um, there was a lot to cover, but I wanted to make sure we didn't miss any of the really big points. So for today, our scriptural passage, it is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This is the birth story of Jesus. Like I said earlier in the message, this scripture includes one of the more familiar scriptures that we find in Luke. At least it's familiar to us because we cover it every year on or around Christmas. It feels a bit wild taking um, the scriptural verse outside of Christmas. I feel like we're such rebels talking about Jesus' birth when it's not December. Um, but the scripture, it is, it's this gift that helps us celebrate Jesus being born into the world and what a gift Jesus is, which is what we do during Christmas. But it also says a lot about what Jesus is going to mean for the world, how his birth narrative comes about, how it is told. Jesus, even entering into the world, says so much about what how Jesus enters into the world says so, so much about what Jesus is going to do in and for the world. So the scripture, it sets the stage for Jesus' ministry to those whom society deems as the last or the least, and how Jesus is the one who is sent to find all of us who are lost and bring us back to God. And I may not have already mentioned this, but um, Luke is all about that social justice life. Uh, he gets into it even before Jesus is born. We hear that. We heard that in the categories. But really shows us how God becoming incarnate in the world is an extension of this emphasis to care for society's outcasts, to really lean into that social justice. So first, starting in the scripture, we hear that Jesus is born during a census which forced people to travel and return to their homes. So this census, it's really the government being able to show the control that it has over the people. And it shows the oppression of the people who give birth and raise Jesus, give birth to and raise Jesus. They are not the kings and the queens, as we would think is better fitting for one who is going to be Lord of all people. Instead, Jesus' parents are people who travel because the Caesar says so. And all of this is because of the census, or all because of the census, we find that there are no rooms for Mary and Joseph. So Mary, who is really pregnant, is forced to travel a long way to Joseph's home, and then there are no rooms because all of the people in their community uh, are also traveling home. So their whole family is there. And traditionally, um, when we hear that there is no room in the inn, we think of like an inn like we know. There is some debate about exactly what that means, but 
really what would mean back in that time period is that people would be staying in the guest rooms for their families or their family's guest rooms when traveling. And because there were so many people, there were no rooms available for Mary and Joseph. And since there were no rooms available, Jesus, after being born, was laid in a manger instead of a crib that was really um, where he went to sleep. And so leading us to believe that Mary gave birth among the animals of the household. So this kind of stable feeling vibe that we find there. And when we're talking about humble beginnings, I mean, it doesn't get more humble than that, right? Born to an oppressed group of people, Mary gave birth not even in their family's home because they couldn't or wouldn't make room for her. But if we're looking at this image of God, that's not how we would imagine God coming into this world, right? At least that's not how I would imagine it. Skipping to the part, I mean, we already know what happens. We know this is what happened. But if I were before this thinking of how God would come into the world, this is not what I would imagine. This little vulnerable baby born to these people of a low social standing who are kind of outcasts in their community. I would imagine God being born to royalty, right? Like someone who has power, prestige. That's that idea. This is the Messiah, right? The savior of all these people. But that's not what God chose to do. God chose someone who society didn't give power to, um, setting the stage for Jesus's ministry. That would really tip all of our preconceived notions of power upside down. And so Jesus's birth story in Luke is really the key to understanding how God chooses to operate in our world. And while we might um, give in to this prosperity gospel, prosperity gospel is this idea that those who have power and are wealthy, they do so because they're blessed by God. Luke reminds us that that's not how God works. God chose to be born among those who are considered least in society. And that's where Jesus starts his life. It really frames uh, the rest of his ministry when we're looking forward. This idea that he has these really humble beginnings, that he didn't start with power, with prestige, with reputation. God chose that life. God chose to be born as this little baby in a manger. So, cool, cool. God is rocking this societal upheaval, right, with how Jesus is born. But what does this really mean for us now, a couple thousand years after Jesus' birth? It means that through Jesus, God has abolished our societal hierarchy and brought us all into this community with one another. Even though this happened a long time ago, this is still something that we struggle to realize today. We still have this hierarchy in society and we try to figure out where we fall. But what we really learn is that being in community is this give and this take. There isn't a hierarchy in community. Instead, we're all in relationship with one another. And there are points in all of our lives where we're the ones who give. And then there are also points in all of our lives when we're the ones that take. It's this give and take relationship that we have. And in our COVID world, I think that we can see this pretty clearly today. Um, up until a few months ago, there were a lot of people who never dreamed that they would be filing for unemployment or weren't worried about how they were going to pay May's rent or bills or buy food. But now, with our economy struggling, with unemployment being a reality for many of us, we see how quickly economic security can be taken from us. It's real and it's scary. And it reminds us that Jesus didn't come into this world when everything was going great. This world isn't perfect for us. Jesus didn't choose to come in at the top when things were awesome. Instead, Jesus was born into a world when things were a bit of a hot mess. And when we needed to be reminded, and that was when we needed to be reminded that God is the one that we can rely on. God is always with us at the high points and at the low points of our lives. And the task that we have is to follow that little baby born and laid in a manger. And it's to remind one another and the world of God's power. Not one that's based on society, not one that's based on these norms in which we normally see power. Instead, it's a power that is, um, saves us when we're most at need. It's a power that recognizes us as people being made in the image of God and created to be a part of this love and be a part of this community that we're drawn into. So this week, we have a task that is before us. Really, this is the task that we always have before us, and that is to remind each other of what the world can look like when we live out Jesus' calling for us to be in the world. So let's care for each other. 
remembering that this give and this take that we have is a part of this community we belong to. So there are a few ways we can do this. Um, we can do this by reaching out to someone, being a listening ear for someone who is struggling, reminding them that they're not alone, reminding them that God shows up when we struggle most. We can also do this by giving to our micro food pantry in a really concrete way. It's been pretty low on food this week, so if you're able, you can do that too. It's that give and that take. When we're able to give, we give, and when we need to take, it is there for us. And so also by visiting our food pantry or micro food pantry if you are in need because we are supplying some pretty good things in there. Um, we can also do this by turning to God when we are scared, when we're lost. If you're someone at a place where it feels like your world is turned upside down right now, listening and being open to hearing how God is showing up in our lives right now, even when it feels like the last place that a Lord would be and would enter. Or if you have any other ideas of how we can be sharing this community, be a part of this, this given this take, I invite you to comment below this video. I know we're using YouTube, and so you can comment in the sections below. Let's work together to find ways to remind our hurting worlds how Jesus continues to show up in unexpected ways through us. Let's pray and close our message for today. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you have called us into this community that turns what we normally expect upside down. This community that reminds us that you show up when it is least expected. And this community that calls us to care for one another as you care for us. Inspire us to show up for each other. Inspire us to reach out to you. And most of all, remind us of this love that you have given to us, this love that you pour into us that we share with the world. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus compares the Word of God to a seed. God plants seeds in our hearts during times of prayer and worship, and we respond by nurturing these seeds and helping them bear fruit in our lives. Part of our response is through our financial gifts and tithes. We remember that every good and perfect gift comes from God, and so we offer a portion of God's gifts back to the Lord. Now, we, we can't receive offerings in the traditional sense of passing offering plates, but we can still give. So, if you are able, and we recognize not everyone is able financially at this time, but if you are able, we invite you to mail checks to the church or to give electronically. You can see our address and website on the screen now. Another way uh, to respond is offering our time and our talents in service. And so here are several ways that you might consider. Number one, micro food pantry. Our church has a micro food pantry at our front doors for anyone who needs food. It is being used more and more frequently, and right now we're a little low on food. So we're asking everyone to help keep our pantry stocked. If you're able, please pick up a little extra food the next time you're shopping and bring the non-perishable items to the church. Thank you for helping us share what we can with our neighbors. Number two, Techie Team. During this time of quarantine, we wanna make sure that everyone can connect with our church online through our church website and Facebook. If you're comfortable with a computer, especially Facebook, and enjoy helping people, we ask you to join the team. If you need someone from our techie team to help you, please contact the church office. Number three, church reopening survey. Right now, our church leaders are working on plans to resume in-person worship services. We don't know when that'll happen, but you can help us by offering your thoughts and opinions in our church survey. You can find a link to the survey on our website. Fourth, escape room. Last but not least, we wanted to give you a heads up about a, a fun youth event that's happening later today. This is for junior and senior high teens uh, who, are, uh, who know a thing or two about Harry Potter. So if you'd like to be part of our Harry Potter escape room, uh, through Zoom, contact Pastor Caitlin today. They're meeting tonight at 6 p.m. for this magical adventure. You can find out more about this event on our church website. 
Now let's pray for our offering. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your abundance. Every day you shower us with love. Every day you remind us how you walk among us and you invite us to follow you and, you know, and to know you. As we receive your words for us this day, help on us to deepen our faith. Receive these gifts of our prayers, presence, gifts, and service. Draw us closer to each other and to you, to your will, to your ongoing work in the world in our lives today. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. While we can't do our typical turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you and so do I, if there is someone who's watching with you in your household, turn to them, say, God loves you and so do I. 
comment below, comment on Facebook. This is this great news that we remind each other of. This great news that God loves us so much, that God shows up as this little itty bitty baby and saves the world. So reach out to someone, remind them, send a text, send a Facebook message, an email, whatever it is, remind them that God loves them so much that God shows up at our hardest points. I've heard that this thing does something where you can like talk to people through it. I don't know. I have to explore that more. But you can also call and let people know. Remind them. We might not be able to gather together in a physical presence, but we are still there for one another. And so let's go with that reminder and let's go with that love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.